collectors as members uh, and members can participate in national and local chapter exhibitions, attend educational workshops, art shares, and network with emerging and established artists, um, art, women artists. Uh, now we, as part of our group, we invite people of all genders, cultures, ethnicities, and, and abilities uh, that want to support our mission and join us. Uh, now this show here is one of those member shows that we have with Hera Hub. Um, and we are so thankful to take advantage of some really great partnerships with this exhibition, uh, not only with Hera Hub, but with Client Razor. Um, how this all started is that I personally had worked with Client Razor, who connected me with Hera Hub and had my work available at the co-working space. Um, and I just thought it was a, would be a really great opportunity for the members of the Women's Caucus of Art to connect to uh, the strong female business owners that work at Hera Hub. Um, and so I spoke with Julia and Danielle, and, uh, Danielle Glosser from Client Razor, and um, she pulled in Philippa Hughes, our juror, and uh, Philippa also brought the theme for the show, Looking for America. Um, and that, that theme is inspired by a larger project that she is spearheading on a national level. Uh, the theme uh, about looking for what it means to be an American these days resonates especially in this DC area location. Um, and these artists and our diverse group uh, took advantage uh, of the theme and took to the challenge to create uh, a what I consider to be a very powerful and uh, often emotional multimedia show. Um, I'm going to have our partner say a few words. Uh, I really want to keep it brief, but I also want to say that this was an extraordinary group of artists in this show. Everyone has been so wonderful to work with and so very professional, and I just really thank all of you um, for creating such lovely work and, and being a part of this. Um, Let's see if I can move my slides. That's me. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Julia. Okay, well, thank you so much. This is just um, actually just a really exciting evening and, and time. When we first started talking about doing this show and, and partnering with um, Women's Caucus for Art and, and Danielle and having Philip do um, be the juror for the show, um, and then the pandemic happened and we thought, oh, what is really going to happen in the future? And so we are thrilled that we've been able to, you know, just even as, a, as an art supporter community, be able to find a way to bring our events virtual so that we can really continue to showcase um, the artists that, um, that at Hera Hub have really been enriching our space for um, five, over five years. We have um, supported women artists by um, showcasing their work in, in our co-working space since we opened in May of 2015. And then in September of 2018, uh, Danielle and I, we had connected earlier, um, but, we, um, but we finally decided to put together some shows together because she had such a great stable of artists within her community. And it just made great sense for us to work together to support the local women artists um, here in Maryland, Virginia and DC. So um, Danielle is, has a fabulous business called Client Razor. We're so excited to, to share about her business. She, what she really does is she helps bring business to artists so that they can actually showcase their works uh, find opportunities to be in um, gallery shows. And then also from the other side, she connects uh, people in businesses who want to get original pieces of art and find something that's specifically unique and, and suits um, their taste. Um, she helps connect from the other end. So she does a lot of strategic planning with her artists. And if you follow her on social media, you'll see all the different things that, uh, ways that she supports that community. And even since I've known her and started working with her, she's grown from um, 80 clients to now I believe she has over 130 clients, both men and women artists, but in all different um, forms of media. Um, so it's been really, um, it's been really such a pleasure to, to work with Danielle. And since we started working together in September of 2018, we've done, um, 
we've done seven shows and showcased um, eight artists in that time. So um, we're very, we're very proud to be doing this um, this show together. And um, I really also have to give a shout out to Madison um, for having the vision to bring to create an opportunity for this type of show to happen and to come to Danielle. She and Danielle started talking and then we met. Um, and then Philip, Philip's vision for which you'll learn more about really was such a perfect fit. Um, I'm just delighted that this whole uh, show is still continuing to happen. It is actually physically installed at Hera Hub. Um, and so I want people to know that if you want to schedule a, an appointment to come in and see the show, it's all, um, we're welcome to do that. Um, and I'll put my, I'll put my email in the chat and it will be on the website and the virtual tour and things like that. But you're welcome to, to schedule a time to come see the work in person because we all know, all, although these virtual receptions are wonderful, there's nothing like actually standing in front of a piece of art and, and really seeing it and experiencing it um, in person. So um, with that, I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Danielle Glosser with Client Razor, and, and she's going to um, be next on the agenda for the evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. I appreciate your kind words. And for <laughs> those of you who don't know Julia, I just want to share with you that she's such an incredible resource to female entrepreneurs in the DMV, not just by providing space for them to work, but also the programming and mentorship that she provides as well is really tremendous. So if you're looking for space, I definitely recommend <laughs> getting a spot at Hera Hub and at least sign up for their listserv so you can tune into their events because they really do a tremendous amount of interesting programs. That said, on to introducing Philippa Hughes. Now I could share with you a description of the hundreds of art projects that Philippa has designed and produced across the country. I could also tell you about all the press that she's received in print, radio, and TV. And I could talk about the numerous prestigious positions that she's held, awards she's won, and public speaking events that she's led. But what's really important to know about Philippa is that she's a change maker. Her latest endeavor is leading Curiosity Connects Us and serving as a partner in Looking for America, which is a national series inviting politically diverse guests to break bread and talk to each other face-to-face -face using art as a starting point for conversation. And although we can't eat together tonight, um, I know that you'll appreciate Philippa's thinking behind this exhibition to spark conversations between people who might not normally meet. So with that said, please welcome Philippa Hughes. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity because, um, you know, I do want to spread this sort of message that I, I feel like a kind of a proselytizer for this message about depolarization in our country and how we get there is through face-to-face -face conversations between people who would not normally meet. But how do we get to that point? Like, how do we get people to actually come to the table, so to speak? And so you know, I think art is one of those ways that um, is really good for that. Sorry, this cat keeps jumping up here. I apologize. Um, and so I thought I, what I'd do is start with going back a little bit to just how this all started. Because, you know, I've been involved in the DC art scene for quite a few years. Um, and, you know, in many different capacities. But I hadn't thought about my ability to use art as a, a way to make change in the world you know, very specific, in, in specific ways. And I hadn't thought about it in political ways. I hadn't thought about, you know, uh, it's just what my role in the world of policy change could be. Um, and it, because I just had, you know, anyway, so I'll let that go for a second. But, you know, of course, everything sort of changed for me. Like everything kind of became clear to me um, after the 2016 election, when, you know, the result of that election was not, to my liking and not to the liking of many people in my circles as well. And so my solution to that problem was to invite people who voted for 
you know, for Donald Trump to come over to my house for dinner. So I've got my little standing desk set up on my dining table here. So this is the dining table where um, three Trump voters and three Trump haters basically came and sat around this table and we had dinner together. And, you know, right from the second they, everybody walked through that door, um, we just started arguing. And it was really actually kind of awesome because it was almost like kind of cathartic to have that kind of conversation. But it wasn't a particularly, you know, fruitful conversation or productive conversation. And so, and, and, and you know, I was so curious, like I just kept doing it over and over because I was like, I really want to ask my own questions. I don't want to just read about stuff in the media and through other people's lenses, like through their books and through their research. So I wanted to just ask my own questions. So I kept doing it over and over. I didn't do it as a project at first. I did it because I wanted to know. I was curious. And so each time I would try something different. Like I, you know, the second time I told people that we couldn't talk about politics at all. And, and until I could, until I told them they could talk about politics. So like for the first 30 minutes, we had to awkwardly talk about anything else. Um, you know, so anyway, so each time I would try different things, I started to learn like, oh, we can actually have these kinds of conversations. And then eventually after two years, um, I organized an art show at the Heyrich House Museum in DuPont Circle. And that show was called A Good American. And I asked seven artists in DC to respond to this question, like what does being a good American mean? And we brought together, um, I think there were like over 50 people who came to that dinner um, from across the political spectrum. So it became not just Trump, Trump haters and Trump lovers, but just because you know, there are many nuances across the political spectrum. And we had this amazing conversation and, you know, and, and the artists were there and there was, you know, people were able to respond to the art as well as to each other. And so that project essentially led to Looking for America, which was a national project in which I traveled around the country for almost a year, organizing art shows called Looking for America. In, in different communities around the country and I asked people to respond to this question, what does it mean to be American in your community? And it was so fascinating to see like what, how different it meant to be an American. We went to Anchorage, Alaska, like how different it was from Alaska to El Paso, Texas. And I, I kind of mentioned El Paso because a, a friend of mine, a person I met because of having a dinner in El Paso is on the call tonight. So it's really fun to, to see her here. And, you know, to, to be like engage in conversations with Americans across the country to see that we're, there is no one way to be American. There are 330 million ways to be American. And the art reflects all those different ways. And that's what was, really exciting to not only did the art reflect all the different ways to be American but it became a starting point for conversations and that's it was that's what's I that's what I hope to to start here you know unfortunately you know right now we can't gather but you know in the ideal world we would have conversations together once we experience the art and so maybe that could be possible once we're all vaccinated by you know the end of May um so I hope that, you know, when you see the art, maybe, you know, we, maybe you'll engage in a conversation differently with somebody in your world. Maybe you could invite somebody to join you in looking at the art, either online or in a private appointment with Julia. And, you know, maybe there's one person that you could have a conversation with um, after you look at the art. And so I'm really excited to share with you not only, you know, the whole art experience, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what I was thinking about when I juried the show. Um, everybody gave really great statements. And so for me, you know, I really, I have, I have like very visceral, like kind of gut reactions to things, to, to art. I'm a very emotional art lover and a, an emotional art collector. Um, I love the, uh, you know, I, I, I don't tend to pay attention to an artist's resume is, is sort of what I'm saying. And so I had a really gut reaction to so many pieces of art because you could see like the emotional, you know, the, the fact that they artists put their, their emotion into these pieces because, you know, we live in, very, as we know, we live in very polarized times and it's an emotional experience right now to be living in this world. And so I love seeing that through the art. Um, 
I loved reading the statements. I, I, I mentioned earlier that I love reading the statements because, you know, well, for me, I'm not only a visual, I don't only appreciate the visual, but I'm a real word person. And so I love like really knowing what uh, was behind each piece. And in some cases, I have to admit, like reading the statement put me over the edge to like wanting to include the piece, um, even if it didn't grab me at first. I think that it's really important to understand the, you know, it's not just the surface, um, but like what is in the artist's mind. And then, you know, as a side note, as a collector of art as well, I will say that oftentimes I feel like I'm a collector of artists as much as I am of art. Um, I really want to know what is in your mind. And so that was really exciting too. Um, Madison, Julia, should, should we go ahead and talk about the winners of the art exhibit or, or should I go ahead and dive yeah, in? Yeah, let's do the, let's do third, second and first place. Okay, great. Um, so it, Juliet Hossein's piece, Support Our Troops, is the third place um, winner. And, you know, I really love this piece on so many different levels. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm not just an art you know, visual art collector. Like I love art of all kinds. So, so I'm especially drawn to the theatrical element of this. And I love like, it's literally like this little stage and you're getting this window into uh, a thing that's happening. And so I really love how she, it's so creative how she presented this situation instead of just, you know, painting the scene, she pulls us back even more. Um, so I really like that. And, and, and then this, you know, I, I love the actual content. Um, I thought about, you know, I, I can't, I apologize. I can't remember the man's name, but remember back when, um, during the 2016 campaign season, when, um, shoot, I really wish I could remember his name, but the man whose, whose son was killed it, while serving our country in the, in the army. And, um, he, you know, his, so he's a gold, he, he, their family, they were a gold star family and Trump basically called them un-American because they were not, you know, uh, you know, they were brown, basically. They didn't look like what he believed Americans um, should look like. And so this piece made me think of that. It made me think of like, again, there is no singular way to look American. And the fact that you wear a, a, a uniform doesn't, protect you from abuse from people who think that Americans have to look a certain way. And so I don't know, I just feel like this piece kind of captured that really well for me. And also it really captured like how proud the, the family, their family is that they get to put these stars um, on, on his shoulder. So I really love this piece a lot. Um, the second place piece um, is this one, Blooms from Brokenness. Okay, this one, it's, I just love this one, again, very personally. Um, it, it's, it, well, she mentions it in her statement. It's this idea of um, the, it's the Japanese process of mending things to make them new again, uh, kins, kinsugai. Um, so basically, I mean, the essential nature of it is that you know, things break and then when you mend them, you actually, the mended piece, the new piece is actually better it's even better, um, but you can still see the scars of the of of where it had been broken. And I really like this because, from you know, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I just really love this as sort of an, a metaphor for America. Like we're breaking apart, but we can put ourselves back together, and we can be even better because we have learned, and we can use you know sort of the pain of that breakup to to learn and be better in the future. And, and I hope you get to see this in, in real life. I really enjoyed seeing it um, when I went by the Hera Hub recently. It's a really exquisite little piece. So it's, it's just so beautifully done. And then finally, um, the first place piece is by Felicia Reed. And I gotta tell you, like, you know, I have to admit like there were a lot of flag pieces that were submitted, which I totally expected. And I, and I wanted that to be the case. Um, I think it's really important that we embrace our flag. Like, I feel like we have lots of really 
um, complicated feelings about our flag now. And it's sort of been appropriated. The image has been sort of appropriated by one side. And in fact, it should belong to all of us. We should feel, we should all feel proud of this flag. And so I really wanted for I, I really wanted to make sure that we had some good representations of our flag in the show. And so it was really hard to pick, you know, pick one to, to sort of be the winner. Um, but I picked this one in particular because it's so cool. Like I thought it was like the way she made it was so interesting. And I really just, uh, just when in reading the description of like, you know, sort of that, that how, how uh, viscerally it's made, like she had, you have to really like get your hands into it. And I, and I'm just, I'm just like fascinated by how she got like the stripes in there. And anyway, so I really would love to talk to Felicia about this because like I'm fascinated about how this was actually made. Um, and so, you know, so again, this appealed to me on just so many different levels, like sort of this patriotic fervor and sort of taking it back, um, but also the actual physicality of it is really appealing to me. So anyway, congratulations to all. Like I think, you know, the entire show, I gotta say, turned out pretty good. And so I really hope you all get that chance to see it. I mean, it was really hard to pick three pieces, but so I, you know, I, I uh, there's many more pieces in the show that I would love to talk about. So this is just a very wonderful sampling and congratulations to all. And I am just feeling really honored to have been a part of this process. So thank you, Danielle, Madison, and Julia for pulling me into this. I, I really feel good about it. Thank you so much, uh, Philippa. I loved your interpretations of these pieces. Um, what we're going to do now is we're actually going to go into the exhibit and we're going to see each of the pieces so the artists can actually have an opportunity to say a few words about their piece. So I'm going to pull that up. Um, here we go. All right, list of work. All right, first we have I, Irene Cloutier. Um, are you here and do you wanna say a few words about your awesome neon piece? Yes, I'm here. Hi, I'm Irene Cloutier. And um, well, first of all, thank you for having us all here and enjoying this conversation. Um, I, I was actually part of um, the show at the Hurek House Museum that Filippa was referring to. So I'm really honored to be part of this um, new exhibition with a new piece. And this piece, I made it last year with, um, I was part of a show that I created, curated and I, the idea came to me as I was interviewing another artist in the show. And the show was about American, um, Latin American immigrants to this country. And when she, the artist stated how, or the difference that he made for her, to have been, um, to come to this country documented and how different the experience is for everybody that comes to this country and immigrants to this country. And immediately when she said, um, she didn't say documented, she said legally and, and immediately started thinking in my mind about the terminology and how we use the, the term illegal alien that thank God um, it recently was banned and, and they're, they, they're change in the language, but it just kind of like started um, a conversation in my head about how the wording and, and the names actually matter, they matter and they make a difference. And a lot of people, since I did the piece, have comment, not necessarily super positive things about this piece because they get triggered into thinking if they're uh, for or against immigration policies. And they don't understand that my, the question that I'm trying to raise is just that we are all humans and I'm just trying to, to, to underline that we need to be treated as humans regardless of whatever actions people commit. People can commit illegal actions, but that does not make them illegals. Because if that was the case, every single in prison will be called illegal as well. So um, that's kind of like the message behind this neon piece. Wow, I love that. Thank you so much. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and say um, if we want to hold questions until the end so we can get through everyone's work. So next, um, do we have Shelly on the line? Shelly Hepler. Here. Hi. Hi, Shelly. Thank you so much for having me in this exhibition. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles and, um, and I appreciate all the um, beautiful artwork that has been um, chosen and, um, and everything that everyone's saying. Um, these are, um, th this is a banner that I created from previous banners. The image behind the uh, geometric form is from the um, Dorothea, um, all of a sudden I forgot her name, um, the Dust Bowl photograph. Um, and it's all about uh, the migrant America, American. And um, it's Dorothea Lang's photograph. And so um, the so the image is being subverted by this, you know, neon kind of um, geometric lights and and glossing over what an immigrant is and or a migrant is. And in Los Angeles, we do have a lot of migrants. I've taught a lot of people who come from Central America and uh, Mexico. And um, it's not, you know, it's a big problem that we have in this country and um, it's, it's subverted. And so that's what this piece is really about, that it's, you know, we have this issue of migrants coming here, it's subverted, but it needs to be brought out and they need help. So that's my piece. Thank you. Sorry guys, I'm having some technical difficulties. Okay, here we go. Um, next, uh, Juliet Mevy. We actually have a triptych, three pieces by her. Are you here, Juliet? Okay, I'm gonna move on, but she has three works um, and they're so great. There are these wonderful um, collage works. There's the second one, Moon Landing. And here's the third. Um, and our next artist is Rosa Vera. Take it away, Rosa. Thank you. Um, I Thank you, Madison, for everything. And to all of you, thank you for coming. Uh, this is my painting. Uh, I came to the United States when I was three years old. And we came as immigrants from Latin America. And uh, in my home and in my family, it was always, uh, English was not allowed to be spoken and it was very strict. And I always felt different from everyone else. Um, I always felt like the outsider. And it was only over the years that I realized that there's so many of us who feel that way and that we're all part of this mix and that we all belong to, um, we all belong to, to this country. And I was so moved when I became a US citizen to see we were asked to stand up. They would read all the countries of the people who are becoming um, citizens and realized the diversity and the richness and what we all bring to this United States. So this painting is the light within. It's the light that, you know, I brought with me and is part of me and is part of all of us. Uh, we all have our lights. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Ellen Maiden Tanner. I uh, first of all, congratulations to the uh, place winners and everyone. And it's so wonderful to hear Philippa's voice again. I haven't heard it for a while. And um, so. This is a piece, it's based off of my, a lot of my artwork is off of my photography. And this piece actually began in 2018. It was a partial sketch at that point. When I got the notification about this show, I decided to finish it because it was an image that was so near and dear to my heart. This was a family 
sitting um, next to myself and my husband at the Tacoma Park 4th of July parade, which is this wonderful time when everyone pours out of their homes in Tacoma Park, comes downtown, and it's so prosaic. We watch floats and we listen to bands and there's school kids and politicians and cars. And it's just a marvelous event that is so full of Americana. It's, it's a joy. And this family, the, the mom was sitting there with her two sons and her teenage son, her older son was so bored. And you could tell she had kind of dragged him to this event. And then once the parade started, he was riveted and it was, it was this kind of magical moment. And that's what I was fortunate enough to get a photograph of. And then I uh, was able to finish this drawing for the show. And they, to, true to the theme, they're actually holding their little paper flags that are handed out uh, along with all the little goodies that are thrown off of the floats. And it was just for me, it's a, it's a beautiful reminder of the incredible innocence that we're capable of that I, and I hope like that shoe I hope we can heal we so desperately need to heal so again thank you Madison and Danielle and Julia and everyone for making this possible thanks, thanks that one all right next we have Susan Magaziner do we have her on the call I am here good evening yay yay Thank you so much to everybody. I'm, I'm just over the moon um, that I'm even joining you. And as I'm sitting here this evening, I, when I explain what I do, I think it will resonate. I'm being brought to tears by your stories. So um, I am a civil rights and education advocate. I'm a fellow with the National Special Education Advocacy Institute. And the faces in this photograph are the students of Umoja House, Umoja meaning unity in Swahili. Um, we just came off of an eight year civil rights case. So we work with the students, the US Department of Education Office for Civil Rights, and we seek justice. So what I do almost every day of my life is um, I strive to create uh, educational environments that are free of discrimination. This particular case was a hate crime, um, a racial hate crime, where students of diversity are actively recruited. Um, they never matriculate. They never make it. Um, the goal is to create equitable communities. And in looking for America, my answer to that question was authentic inclusion, which does not exist. So every day I live and I feel the pain. Each one of those spaces told me a story. I then tell that story to the Office for Civil Rights. In this case, it was Philadelphia. Um, I also have another photograph in the show, which is a high school student. I'll take you there now. Okay, thank you. Here we go. This is a Connecticut high school student that would never have seen this day. So it's not so much the photograph. It's the meaning um, in the faces. That's the triumph of justice. And so it is called Justice Reigns. So this young man in a very white institution was the only Asian American. His parents were refugees. I know their family story and to this day we're very, very good friends. He is a Buddhist monk. They're loving people. He was the only Asian America in this predominantly white high school. There was a situation that is not even related to him, but he was scapegoated. He was shamed. He was given severe, very harsh discipline. And because of the shame of the family, he was hidden in his attic in his home for two weeks. And I don't even want to go <laughs> to that story. Um, and so we got corrective relief for him. He was given all of the same equal courses as his other white peers and the targeting ended. So that, that, those are the stories in my photographs. Um, wow, thank and I, you. And, I, and I'm just 
very blown away to even be here. So thank you. Thank you because by including these photographs, um, we're celebrating a lot. And actually today, the Office for Civil Rights did receive the link to the show. Oh, great. In, in, me, in me thanking them. <laughs> thank you for your work on that. Thank, I, thank you, Madison. As an aside, I, I always love um, when I see artists incorporate work from their, their, their other job, so to speak, because yes. I have another <laughs> job. Um, mm -hmm. But these are, these are beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Mary Elizabeth Gosselink. Hi, thank you so much for including my piece in the show. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all the hard work behind putting the show on. <clears throat> so I guess what I wanted to say about my piece was um, as a white American, uh, four years under the Trump administration, <clears throat> it showed me how much I have to learn from the civil rights movement and, <clears throat> and from the lived realities of black Americans who've been trying to lead the society towards a more fair and just place for generations. Um, <clears throat> it's inspired by the title of a book by the famous civil rights icon, Angela Davis, the title being Freedom is a Constant Struggle. Um, I photocopied pages from the constitution and I cut them into stars and uh, I attempted to create an effect of the stars being buffeted by a strong wind, but still trying to make their way uh, to the light in the corner of the painting. And um, I guess <clears throat> what I take away is that freedom is no one's birthright, which is something that I think as a white American, it took the Trump years for me to understand. And uh, simply voting every four years is not enough to ensure the survival of the democracy. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, I guess all I can say about it is I have a new, newfound reverence for and appreciation of uh, all of the civil rights activists, past and present. That's lovely. Thank you. Next, we have Christine Zamuda. Christine, are you online? I am. Hi, everyone. Uh, I very much connect with Mary Elizabeth, your your sentiments there, and um, I, I'll just share, hey, I'm, I'm pleased to be part of the show. It's, I saw it in person and just uh, was blown away by some of the work, and the stories are, are even uh, more powerful, so it's, it's great to be here. This piece is, is quite different than, than most of my work, all of my work, in fact. Um, I tend to go into the studio with my mood, life experiences, and then I turn on the music and see what happens. I never have a plan, and I just create that way. But when I saw this open call, I actually felt um, very compelled to submit a piece and I think as artists, when you see, you know, an opportunity, and especially the way this call was written, to help bridge the polarization that has been happening in our country, that you have to respond to it. And this piece in particular, um, I look back on, you know, a, a, a lot of a pain, a lot of um, healing that still has to happen. Yet when uh, Amanda Gorman read her poem at the inauguration, I felt this overwhelming sense of hope. And I've reread that poem, A Hill to Climb, about 50 times and felt that one way to respond to this call, um, hopefully inspire others, is I took some of her words from the, the poem and uh, put them into a flag that was purposefully washed in yellow uh, what is, you know, um, uh, sort of in deference to, to what she wore that day. And I feel like, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now, we'll be looking back on what she spoke about. And hopefully um, more people will embrace her words, uh, you know, for there is always light if we're brave enough to see it and if we're brave enough to be it. And uh, that's my piece. Uh, more of my work is at Art Gallery by Z and just honored and thankful for the opportunity. Love it, thank you. 
Next we have Juliet, our third place winner. Thank you so much. Um, this was uh, an incredible show. Um, I'm always particularly love shows that I would go and see and celebrate and love, even if I was not participating in it. So I feel very blessed that I was um, with you all. Um, so when I saw the notification for looking for America, um, I knew right away what I was going to make the theme of my piece um, because this piece has been inside me for a long time. Um, and uh, I didn't know how I was going to frame it yet. I knew that I was going to showcase my husband um, because I have a lot of veterans in my family. Uh, my grandparents, my stepfather, a lot of people served in my family. And then I married somebody who um, was going into the Air Force. And his father is a now retired colonel in the Air Force. But his father and his mother also happen to be immigrants from Bangladesh. And um, so they have taught me a whole lot about what it is to be a minority, a Muslim, in the military. I didn't have any clue what it was like from another point of view to live the military life. Um, so this particular scene was when he was pinning on um, to be captain. And um, we were living in Phoenix at the time and he was graduating from medical school. And from there we went on to San Antonio and then we went on to Japan and we went to Delaware and New Jersey, and now we're here. He is now not, um, he's now civilian, but um, we have this, this history um, of going around all over the world and seeing people's reactions to Muslims, really. Um, and it's been incredibly different than I would have expected growing up in Silver Spring, Maryland, where I met him originally and, you know, there's gobs of diversity there and I never even thought anything of it um, until we got out into the world and I saw, you know, especially in military communities because there's a whole lot of Islamophobia that's basically accepted. Mm -hmm. um, and it was shocking to me to see people just like, oh, you know, it's okay to be afraid of Muslims. It's okay to look at them as the other. And I, and then this, those same people would say things like, oh, we're major patriots, we support our troops. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you realize you're talking about the same people sometimes. You know, some of those people that are your military are your immigrants, are your other religions of other colors. Um, it's one and the same. So I was hoping that people would be able to start to realize um, their interconnectivity in all of that. And so when I saw Looking for America, I knew that that was the theme that I wanted to bring out, but I didn't know how to frame it. And um, so when I was trying to figure that out, I thought, okay, well, who am I? Um, I am an actor um, before I was a visual artist. So I was trained with a BFA in performance. Um, so I like to look at things from a theatrical point of view. And so even though I'm in this scene, um, we're really all the audience looking at this. And I wanted to kind of change people's perspective on the military and minorities. So I wanted to frame it into um, where the viewer is actually the audience looking at this and perhaps looking at it differently. Theater's often historically been a mode of um, holding a mirror up to nature, um, of uh, catching the conscience of the king. Um, and here, we don't have a king, the people are the king. So I wanted to bring that out and also the whole like theater of war concept. Um, so I didn't, somebody asked why I didn't put anybody in the audience. Um, that was because I wanted to make everybody who's looking at it um, in the gallery or online or whatever, they are the audience. So I wanted you to be able to put yourself right in those seats. Um, and the theater specifically is the National Theater. So I very painstakingly recreated um, the National Theater uh, because of its, you know, patriotic um, and historical significance. 
So that is where I went with that. Thank you again. Thank you. That was fantastic. I didn't realize how autobiographical this piece was. Uh, next, we have Dan Cooper Cabe. Now, I want, just want to say how pleased I am to be a part of this. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the hard work. Um, this piece is called um, um, One House, and it, it looks back on the immigrants that came to this country uh, in early 1900s, uh, including my grandfather. He came to this country when he was 12 years old from a little um, region in Italy called Basilicata. And um, he came with his parents in order, his parents wanted a better life for, for him and his siblings and for them. Um, they were illiterate. And yet my grandfather uh, graduated uh, from Fordham University with a law degree in 1929. So their, their dreams did come true. So this is a little homage to those immigrants that were so brave in the early 1900s to come to this country. And I, um, I honor their, their fortitude and their um, belief that their lives were gonna be better in this country. And, and most often they were better in this country. Um, this is a depiction of my uh, grandparents and um, the uh, manifest that uh, shows their names coming to this country from, from Italy. And then the fact that I have some knitting on there because um, they came with their crafts. They, they were all very crafty people. And that um, idea of making crafts and make, make being makers uh, came down to me from them. So I put a little uh, uh, homage to that as well. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. All right. Next, oh crap, did we go out of the list view? Sorry guys, hold on one second. I don't know what happened. I guess we'll go here. Gayatri, are you online here? Yeah, hi, um, it's uh, said as Gayatri. Um, I my apologies. No worries. Um, hi, uh, thank you all for selecting my photography. Um, I am a young photographer and a budding artist, so this is the first for me. Um, I took this photograph um, last spring um, during the Black Lives Matter um, movements and protests. Um, I titled the titled this piece, This is America. Um, I know um, that's been used before, but that I think is the point that I'm trying to make um, with this piece that um, even though these protests were happening, this is not a new situation. Um, we've been going through this for hundreds of years, um, particularly oppressing Black lives and um, harming Black lives. And so, um, I was personally there as well in support of the movement and um, just saw this father and daughter together at the protest and, you know, hundreds of people were there um, for this movement and I, I'm struggling to speak just because it's so, I still can't um, believe some of the events going on even just yesterday. Um, but I think this really um, struck me because what have we come to that a young black girl, I mean, this is a child, has to hold up a sign um, saying, I want to live um, for us to really hear. I hope one day we hear and listen in this country and that um, the father has to wear a shirt that particularly says I can't breathe. Um, so yeah, I think um, this, this moment just really struck me. Amazing, thank you so much. Next we have Karina. Hi guys. Um, so thank you everyone, you know, for making this show happen. I feel really honored 
um, to have been chosen as someone in the show and, and seeing everyone else's pieces and hearing the commentary just reinforces what a great group this is. Um, so this piece is called Tears of America. And um, similarly, it was inspired by the protests that took place last spring. Um, so I found myself very frustrated. And by way of background, I'm an attorney and I do some pro bono work, um, although in this space, it's still more challenging to navigate. Um, and you can only do so much. And I think my motto in life is not a, not any one person can do everything. Um, but I, I sat with, you know, everything that was happening and going on and became increasingly more frustrated, upset, um, and just like really disheartened and kind of, you know, dumbfounded that, you know, then 2020, we're sitting here still dealing with so many of these issues. And, um, so just a little bit more about this piece. It came from a collection that I had the idea for following um, the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other um, killings and instances of police brutality last spring. And, you know, I, I was really upset with the flag. So this goes back to comments made earlier in the show um, or, or in tonight's presentation. The flag didn't feel like it was something that I was proud of anymore. I'm the descendant of immigrants. Flags have always been a thing that I've been around. And for me, you know, it wasn't something that I really felt tied to anymore. And so I kind of wanted to strip the flag back a little bit, take away some of the more traditional Americana elements, the red, white, and blue, for example, and also kind of compare it in a way against um, other flag iterations that we've been seeing. So maybe like the Blue Lives Matter flags and things like that. And so um, in particular in the middle, I actually put a piece of mesh over some of the names. There are some pieces that are carved out from it, um, but it's meant to have a double meaning with the prison industrial complex in America. And also in particular, how we imprison uh, an astonishing number of people generally, but particularly black Americans. Um, and also, in a way, a historical tribute to the Underground Railroad. You'll see the names of many victims of police brutality throughout the piece. Um, and you'll also see um, there's some texture and detail there. Um, but if you look, you'll see some paint dripping and that's meant to symbolize tears. And that's really where the name of this came from. You know, tears shed by everyday Americans, by Black uh, Americans and their families. Uh, just kind of a reflection of the general frustration, I think, going on. Um, and then in particular, in, in um, lieu of the stars, uh, there are dried paint pieces that were all spray painted. Um, and I originally thought about making them red, but I did want to keep the piece kind of monochromatic. Um, and it's meant to represent bullet holes, which of course are not the only form of a weapon used. Um, but especially with regards to instances of police brutality that are more common and with protests um, also at the time, um, we were seeing more instances of regular guns or rubber bullets being used. Um, so that's a little bit more about this piece. It definitely, I would say is my most meaningful piece and I labored over this piece. Um, so this is a print of the original, but um, yeah. let me know if you have any questions about it and thank you all for, for listening. Lovely, thank you. Next we have Linda Lowry, who has two pieces in the show. Thank you. Um, I wanna say the show looks great. And if any of you haven't seen it in person, you should probably stop by because the space is lovely and every piece looks like it belongs on the wall it's hanging on. So I was just overwhelmed when I saw the show. About, um, I guess in uh, 2018, because of a lot of the rhetoric around um, pe people of color, I decided to start a series of paintings of people from different countries. And my original idea was I would get people who were born in as many countries as possible. And if I presented them large and to a viewer, I couldn't see how they could not identify with that person being represented in the portrait, how they couldn't realize their common humanity. And so I've been painting people from different countries for a couple of years now, unfortunately with the um, 
virus. I haven't had access to as many people as I would like. This woman is from Peru and I think she's quite beautiful and with a, a face that appealed to me. Awesome, thank you. The and next, guess, yep, the next piece um, is a friend of mine from um, Ivory Coast and she is such a wonderful person that she's everything that I could aspire to be. She's always cheerful, helpful, um, empathetic, happy. And I hope that comes through in the picture because I, I can't think of anybody that would be a better role model. And I feel that way about many of the people that I've painted, so thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Next, we have Heidi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, everybody in Madison for Julia, everybody for your hard work. I got a sneak peek of the show when I helped hang the show and I just loved everything and hearing all the backstory behind all the works is so powerful. Um, so I have two pieces that are um, on a similar theme. Um, so this one and um, my other piece that has embroidery. I actually made them um, over Christmas um, on a theme that's been talked about a lot today. Um, just my own experience of how deeply, um, you know, sort of divided and the country is and also in our personal lives, uh, dealing with um, family members who have really like spiraled into disinformation around COVID. <laughs> What, it was a difficult time for me not going back for Christmas, but having all of my family gathered. So this is sort of like the more hopeful <laughs> take on um, on that whole experience. And then I don't know if Madison, you could go to the other one. Yeah. Um, I think you, your other one is in between. Oh, okay. I'll come back to that one. Okay. If that's okay. That's fine. And then this one was really just... Um, uh, definitely like how I was feeling, almost like a manifestation of how I was feeling. And both are from um, vintage photos that I painted and then embroidered on top of that. So I like to layer lots of lots of things on top of one another, kind of both symbolic of how complex and layered life is. <laughs> um, but yeah, in particular, the, the embroidery, embroidery has really been speaking to me lately. And this one was almost like a literal um, manifestation of how it was feeling, um, both how it's all sort of inescapable, inescapable for all of us um, and kind of like how to find our way through the entanglement and knots. Um, do you want, do you mind going back to that? Yeah, one? there you go. Thanks, Madison. Um, so this is many, many layers as well. Um, and part of um, a series um, that I'm calling my Kindred Spirits series, it's um, very inspired by sort of ancestry and history, um, but feels really resonant today in particular. Um, so I'm fourth generation Japanese American. And um, so my grand great grandparents immigrated before World, World War II, but, um, you know, my mom has never been to Japan, hardly speaks Japanese, and constantly is sort of asked about, like, your English is so good and all these things. And so this piece was really sort of a manifestation of many, many layers. It's a mosaic of um, geodes that my mom collected, some broken glass, and then I painted over that with um, images of the railroad because my grandparents and great-grandparents soon came over. Um, many generations ago, um, worked on the railroads in the Southwest and also in mines frequently. So it's kind of a, a very personal layered piece. Wow, lovely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Madison. All right. Now we have Angie. I know Angie um, is not able to speak tonight. Um, 
but her pieces are really lovely. And I think you can click on the information button here and it when you're in the virtual tour and it does give a little um, statement about each work. And this series portrays vulnerable children and addresses issues of systemic racism, neglect, abuse, poverty, and indifference. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. You guys can go back and read it. Um, but there are beautiful assemblage pieces and I hope you can see them in person. And then the next one of hers is the second place piece, which I think um, uh, Philippa did a really amazing job of describing the technique and the meaning of the technique. Um, so again, come see it in person. Email Julia for an appointment. Um, next we have Holly. Holly had to leave, um, but she did send me a few words for, for me to say about her work. Um, and she says, while, while you look for America in this piece, you will find all of, all of the other countries, which is fitting since we are a nation of people from many nations. The canvases may be viewed in different ways. So it's four canvases um, that you can sort of mix and match together. Just, and you can view them in different ways, just as we are a, a nation where seeing things in many ways is celebrated. Speaking Pink Globally, which is the title, is about a very important movement. This painting is, is one of several which are speaking pink. A pink line runs through them all uh, because the women's movement is ongoing and worldwide. Really powerful message there. Thank you, Holly. And next we have Rosemary. There I am. Um, <clears throat> this piece is it. It's actually um, reflected in a number of the pieces that have already been shown. I, there's sort of common threads um, for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, and it's deeply personal, but it's also universal the way I thought about it. Um, it is a nod to my Irish ancestors, ancestry on both sides of my family and how um, they came from Ireland just to escape starvation and of course, you know, in hopes of a better life uh, in this country. And they came with nothing and they became builders and makers of things. I think I've heard that said already this evening. Um, buildings, um, my great grandfather was a stone carver um, this reflects a lot of my, my father's side in that um, my grandfather started a sign company in Baltimore, Maryland. My father ran the sign company um, later after he passed away. Uh, my father used a Polaroid camera and went around taking pictures of all of his signs or of buildings he thought should have a new sign. Sometimes I would ride with him in the car um, when I was about 10, you know, from about age eight to about 10 when it was, it was okay and not uncool to ride with your dad in the car and with him while he took pictures of the signs. Um, I use that bulk Polaroid camera in my work now. The, one of the, his actual camera plus others that I have, I do, um, Polaroid photography, and there is actually Polaroid imagery in this. I'm really interested in process and materials. Um, the words are typeset, that I typeset them on cards. And I, I created uh, these components at different times and always thought I'd use them for something, but I wasn't sure what exactly. Um, so when this call came out, and thank you Women's Caucus for Art and Madison and Hera Hub and Client Razor and Philippa, for this show because it's really fabulous. Um, it, it came to me, you know, sort of putting this all together, the materials and the words and um, these words are on a, were on a sign in Baltimore, um, a window sign in a, a, the old Greyhound bus station. And I thought about the idea of travel and how, you know, the, migrants, immigrants, um, either due to, you know, war, crime, violence, persecution, starvation, 
um, for whatever the reason, they travel and they travel out of desperation and how that word travel means a lot of different things. And so this was sort of a full circle kind of um, piece in that the travel from my ancestors was out of desperation. And this sign, this travel sign was for leisure and enjoyment. And I thought, you know, that's sort of the full circle experience of I think some immigrant families. So uh, that's the story of my piece. Thank and you I so really much. enjoyed listening to everyone's stories. It's all so interesting. Yes. Um, Thanks. So thank you. Thank you. All right next we have we have Leslie Harris, and Leslie has two pieces in the show as well. I do have two pieces, and um, uh, they kind of go together, but we'll have to look at them separately. Um, so it's interesting that I'm hearing other people who have a background in human rights. Um, I was uh, a uh, human rights and civil liberties lawyer and advocate for my whole career, and that that, uh, that is, uh, informs my work. Um, I spent a lot of time in those years talking to and trying to persuade people who had very different views. And I was not always successful, but, I, but we were able to talk. And a lot of that actually happened in Congress uh, because I did a lot of lobbying on, you know, everything from you know, gay rights to civil rights, free, free speech. And that ability to talk um, and that importance of the ability to talk to democracy was kind of like part of my life. Um, I have to say that for the past four years, uh, I have been looking for America and worrying that the democracy um, was really slipping away uh, and that free speech had just turned into a right to scream uh, and abuse people rather than an opportunity for us, all of us to put our views into this, you know, what, what the law calls marketplace of ideas and try to find the best solutions. Um, and a lot of the time I was kind of depressed over the last four years. And when I, except when I started to watch this devastating assault, June 1st on my birthday of the peaceful, um, Black Lives Matter uh, protesters uh, in front of the White House, all I could feel was rage. Um, and that seemed to have been the start of a new series, which be I, I call the Rage Paintings, um, the last of which I finished uh, right after the assault on the US Capitol. Um, both of these paintings, uh, without my realizing it, were still painted kind of in red, white, and blue. Um, but in this one, I was looking at just the uh, torn apart nature uh, of our democracy, of our free speech, of our freedoms. Um, I paint a lot on uh, board and I do a lot of layering. And in both of these paintings, I'm using a very layered Japanese um, paper underneath parts of it. Um, in this one, I have little bits of gold underneath because I wanted to continue to believe that there was um, something glimmering, some hope somewhere um, deep below. The next painting starts to, you know, um, uh, which is called all that glitters, um, I think I was fit feeling more hopeful or perhaps I was simply starting to, um, yeah, I think I, I don't know if I was more hopeful or I was hoping to be hopeful, um, but I, underneath is all painted with gold. And, and then I do, I do a lot of layers, a lot of scraping. Um, I call myself an uh, a painter and basically an archaeologist for the for the way I work my process. So um, this was another painting from that series. It also uses the um, Japanese um, 
paper, particularly down near the bottom. Um, and again, without even thinking about it, it's red, white, and blue. Um, uh, the first one, maybe we're torn apart. This one, maybe this blue is coming down to um, cool off the rage that I'm feeling. Um, I have no rage now. It's amazing. For the last three months, mm -hmm. I am not digging into my paintings as hard. I am um, thinking, um, um, I am painting things of hope. And um, I don't think I painted anything for four years that, that really reflected a sense of hope about, about the country. Um, I was just simply too devastated. Um, yes. So, um, thank you. Thank Lovely. you. Thank you. Well, next we have me. <laughs> um, my name is Madison. I'm an artist. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll try to stay really brief. Um, my practice involves a lot of layering of paint and paper, mainly uh, book pages um, with other found materials, uh, not only to create an aesthetic uh, like layer and, and, and texture, but um, Book pages are really fascinating for me to work with because people uh, tend to pick out words in a page, um, words that jump out to them specifically and, and, and create their own story and create their own narrative and therefore sort of create their own um, connection to a work. And that, that, wor that connection can be different from person to person. And that's really fascinating to me. Um, this piece was created and my, and my work is pretty much uh, um, in this style is abstract, but um, this piece was created um, right after January 6th and um, it's titled Both Sides. The painting, the papers that were used, I have a lot of old books and I just sort of, I don't, I don't pick out books specifically, uh, not always um, to work with. And so this book specifically that I was just playing around with um, is actually a book in French. And so you have like a book in, a, in a, you know, words in foreign languages, um, not a lot of people, especially in this country, would be able to read or, or um, understand. And so you kind of get the feeling of, of, of otherness there. And, and um, like, uh, like Philippa was talking about earlier, sort of like the polarization. Um, and so it's called both sides because uh, I feel that um, the Americans really have a responsibility to, to take a you know, come to the table, as Philippa said, and, and meet each other. And even if you don't understand something um, off the bat, you can dig a little deeper and, and, and see the other side of things, even though it's different from yours. So that's mine. And next, we have Karen Cohen. Karen, are you with us? Here I am. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for picking this piece in my show. And I want to give a quick shout out to Felicia for winning first prize. I'm so impressed. She was the first fiber artist that we got to meet um, in our art league. And um, her work is just beautiful. And it wins awards a lot. Um, and also, I was impressed with the juror for this, uh, Philippa. Um, so as soon as I saw her name, I thought I have to get in on this too. And it was a great theme. Um, I'm a photographer by trade uh, for since high school. But last year during COVID, I started to draw and sketch from my photographs um, because it just filled my time. So after Trump held up the Bible at the St. John's Episcopal Church down at the uh, White House, uh, that weekend, uh, there wasn't uh, really a rally, but everybody went down there. The walls had been erected. You could see the white walls in front of this um, family. And um, there was signage all over. It was very peaceful. People were dancing. It was just a fun, um, beautiful day. And I was walking behind these people and I was like, wow, this is the truly American family and how committed they are to bring their little girl. The picture actually looks different. I'm going to just show you real quick if I can pull it up on my phone. Um, there was a boy in the picture. I don't know if you can see this. Um, 
But anyway, um, I just love the little girl in between the mother and father and them wearing their flags on their backs. And it was just it's so impressive for me. So anyway, thanks again. And I'm happy to be part of this show. Thank you, Karen. Whoa, okay, so it skipped a bunch of pieces. <laughs> Let me see <laughs> if I can. I apologize, guys. Um, oh, let's see. I know Sissy had to leave. Um, but her work is very beautiful. Um, and again, you can uh, come in here and, and look at the piece. I know we have Chanel's pieces. Chanel, are you online? Uh, yes, I am. All right, let's see. Um, if you want to say a few words, apologies, I'm having oh, no, you're fine. technical <laughs> imperfections. <laughs> oh, thank you guys for um, selecting my work. It's been a while. Um, I also apologize. I was online with school. That's why I didn't log in earlier. Um, I'm at VCU right now trying to finish up my bachelor's in fine art, which is also concentration in communications art. Um, but just to hear um, all the amazing stories and see some ridiculously amazing art is just blows me. But the stories behind it speaks volumes. Um, but thank you again to the hub and to Daniel Reiser. And I don't want to mispronounce her name, <laughs> who helped to like, ah, who helped to like work for um, my piece. So oh, thank, you. thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, the one you're looking at right now is every 30 seconds. Uh, one of us goes missing. I knew everybody would um, mostly concentrate on what had just happened the last four years. And I didn't want what I found out just to do like a research that my daughter had done. And I just couldn't believe the staggering numbers that she found about missing um, black women, children, teenagers. And it's, and when I calculated it down to every 30 seconds, I just, I was in bewilderment. I was like, that, that can't be possible, but it is. And um, hopefully those numbers have gone down, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, which is a good thing. But um, every 30 seconds, a black woman goes, or a black girl, child goes missing. That's crazy. And the rate of what they don't look for is to find them. And I thought that was very important to see. I know everybody couldn't, and my daughter kind of pointed it out to me, um, told me you couldn't really relate to my why, which was in words. I wanted you to really move into this piece. I wanted you to read everything that was up on this piece, not just the big letters. Um, I also wanted you to see that even though those numbers are big and are staggering, as you come closer to the piece, you'll see some of the flag is missing. Some of the women are just outlined because it's like we didn't matter, still don't matter. Um, and I'm hoping that change um, with other uh, programs that are out there to track it as well as make sure that we are aware, um, not just black women that goes missing. Um, we're number two, the first is Caucasian females. Um, but every 30 seconds, that's, I just couldn't believe it. So that's where that piece came from. Mm -hmm. um, the second piece is um, about America. We have an old song. I do remember reciting this in school. My kids recited it in school, but you've ever really re read the lyrics of the song. And my country tis of thee is, back then maybe, maybe it was, but now it's not. Um, I took the flag because at that time we were all like everybody was stating, going through some nonsense in our country that either we didn't want to acknowledge it or again, we just, well, it doesn't pertain to us. So, you know, it's on the back burner and it, nobody cares about it, but this is something we still do in school. And I wanted, I just wanted to take out the words that did not apply. 
And the things that they were talking about, oh, this, this land of liberty is for everybody. No, no, it wasn't. And it still is to a certain degree. And what you see under the flag that has been um, dismantled is they're all black men. And I think that what was going on in our country, what was still going on in the world, and even today, and it'll probably be there even five years from now until we as a country acknowledge you know, what we've done. Um, people don't like to hear that Germany did acknowledge what they had done. And I love that they teach them every day, this can never happen again. It shouldn't happen again. And yet in our country, they find different ways to make this happen. So, um, and then I brought them a little bit more to the forefront so you can see them. Um, but I just broke it down and took out the, only the things that I really felt apply to our world right now. Again, thank you for the opportunity. I saw some amazing work. I, I did see it online. I haven't seen it in person yet. And hopefully I'll see you guys again in a different show. <laughs> thank you. I think, we have, I think we have one more piece left and I think it's this one. <laughs> Felicia, first place. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can. Um, I am so emotional and um, I want to thank everyone, uh, the caucus, friends, family, Hera Hub, Client Razor, Philippa, um, she was right in that this piece, she picked, she picked up something amazing. This piece is a very passionate piece as are all of my work because of how I channel and they're made. They come from someplace very, very deep based on a life of abuse from five to 51. And this piece here was made out of the dang it, we're going to include everyone between these stars and stripes, <laughs> you know, somehow, some way. Not only are we going to include people, but we are going to include nature. We're going to include our, our, you know, our resources and our capabilities and our aspirations and our dreams. That's where all the colors come from, uh, the inside. And I really wanted to make stars. And I said, we're not even deserving of stars until we, until we include everyone and denormalize some of what we are seeing now that has been very prevalent to some of us, but not to everyone. So, um, um, it, it's true that I got my hands all up in this. I got tears all up in it. It's wet felt it. It's a very, very, very tedious process. Um, I wasn't sure that the fibers would even like each other to reflect the intent that I set for the, the wrap. It is a wrap. Someone mentioned that they could wrap themselves. It is a wrap. I make what are called healing wraps and they do wonderful on exhibit. This piece was very, um, very moving for me in that I, I couldn't watch the news. I couldn't hear anything. I just had to get this energy out of me and say, we are more than the stars and the stripes that uh, were created as representation of this country. That flag means nothing without us being included. Um, and I think, you know, we really need to start, stop looking at the American flag and start looking at what makes up America. Um, so um, I hope to make a, more and like this one. It was um, amazing. It surprised me as they all do, because I don't know how they're going to turn out um, because of the way that I channel in, in my work. And I think the most moving part of uh, the most moving part that I've had since um, I finished it, was hand, handing it off to the two ladies that came outside and got it from me in the car and said that we're going to take great care of this. Thank you for this. We really love to see it in person. I, I think that was more, uh, more powerful than me completing it because I was actually handing off um, the thoughts 
and the intense and the energy and like, do you get this? Do you get this? And they thanked me for it. Um, so I'm very intuitive. And like I, like I said, you know, every form of abuse, I have been through it up until 51. And this is the way that I express myself. And can we include not only me as a survivor, but can we just include humans in humanity? We tend to forget that uh, what makes up human humanity is human beings. And I, I think that in a lot of aspects, we've forgotten how to be humans. So I'm really driven by expression. Um, and if anyone here, I have some friends here and they know me like, ooh, how she even survived everything that she's been through. And I don't want anyone to go through nearly anything of what I've been through. And I, I, I'm an advocate, an artist, a speaker, a coach, a quality manager, um, a few other things. And this has been one way that I have been able to not only heal myself, but also to help others heal. The raps came about as an answer to a constant prayer. I believe in God, so that's my belief system. And it was, God, please wrap me in your love and protection to get me through this last round of abuse. It was brutal. And um, I knew nothing about felting, nothing. I knew about felting, but not how to felt. And um, the, so the raps became an answer to a real prayer for survival. And that's the message that I bring. I'm truly grateful for all the work that is here and that I stand with these powerful uh, messages and, and, and the lineup. And I had no idea how um, emotional this show would be. Um, and to see so much uh, grace and um, healing also, and the commitment that we are going to include others and take care of them and believe them and that things won't be as bad as they have been. So we're in a shift and we're going to keep going. I love this piece. I want to wrap myself up in it myself, but I have a feeling that it will be in its shadow box frame for a little while. <laughs> um, and I won't get that, um, that pleasure. So it's been prayed over. It's been cleared with sacred smoke. It's been um, oiled up with all kinds of essential oils and great healing uh, energy has been placed in it. And I wish and want the best for all of us. So that's my message. Thank you, Felicia. That was beautiful. And I did not intend for us to finish with yours, but it worked out perfectly. <laughs> Um, I know we're, I know we're at the end of our time. Um, did I miss anybody's work? It doesn't, I don't hear anybody say, um, yeah. cool. Well, that's great. Um, and so I, I just want to, we can wrap it up and, uh, thank you everyone for coming and sharing your thoughts about your work. It's been such a lovely evening hearing from everyone and, and congratulations, um, to the, the winners and yeah. we love everything. It was such yeah. a pleasure to put the show together. It really was. Well, I, I just want to say that tomorrow morning I get to go in and see these works. Yeah. I have to say, <laughs> I'm going to look at them differently because it's mine. So thank oh, you. Great. Wonderful. Sorry to get emotional. But it is. All right, everybody. So thank you so much. What an amazing show. Let's give a shout out to Philippa and, and Danielle and Madison. I mean, this is just, you know, mm -hmm. you can tell I'm affected by it. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. I'll send a recording.